going to throw us to the ultrasound, but it's going to talk about uh, rapid recurrence and thrombosis in general. <laughs> something that's really difficult for patients and it's been used against the procedure for a long time and that's the non-responder or the person who responds with, a, with some improvement that rapidly go away. One could argue that there are many reasons for this but before we get into that uh, this is what, what I define as non-responder. People who have no improvements, people who have uh, improvements that are unsustained and they regress within days to weeks and then there are people who have worsening symptoms. These are what I call non-responders. And I kind of looked at it myself and I came up with a whole variety of things that are causes of non-response. Non-response is of somebody who has a little bit of improvement that goes away rapidly, possibly could mean that they had a placebo effect. We know that any treatment of MS is associated with beneficial effects of placebo. So perhaps some of the patients have placebo. Unfortunately, there are people who are saying if you have my, you have some improvements that go away very rapidly, you have a placebo, and that this treatment is not for you. And I would argue that there are many explanations for the non-response or minimal response that are organic and treatable. But, and I'm going to try to talk about them as quickly as possible. Um, in, the, in the premise study, they had exacerbations. It's certainly possible that one can have an exacerbation that parallels the time of the angioplasty. That may make them worse. And certainly I've had patients who had exacerbations after treatment. The cause of that is really hard to understand. It may be that they were ready for a uh, relapse. It might be that balloon angioplasty would prolong ballooning uh, or excessive ballooning or just too much ballooning for that particular patient, even though it may be necessary, may be enough to cause enough venous abnormality to incite a, uh, a, an exacerbation. Maybe. They don't, they, they maybe while some of the symptoms could be caused by multiple, uh, by, let's call it CCSVI because everybody accepts that, but perhaps the symptoms could also be caused by the damaged neurons that they have. Well, that's quite possible. We all, from the day one, ex, ex, uh, suspected that all the lesions cause all the problems. <coughs> well, maybe that's not true, but maybe some of them are. And if you have symptoms that could be caused by CCSVI, some venous problem, and you have the same symptom that can be caused by uh, inflammatory disease, demyelinization, and ultimately neuronal death. No amount of angioplasty is going to take a dead neuron and resurrect it. So it's quite possible, quite possible, that some patients do not get responses in some of their symptoms simply because it's caused by the demyelinization and the neuronal, neuronal damage that they have. And then nothing that's going to really work for them. We have to understand that we're looking at two things, one on top of the other, and one may not, may one dominate. Okay, those being that said, there are a number of uh, explanations of why people get non or minimal response uh, after treatment that's effective. Well, they can have an incomplete or failed diagnostic evaluation. They can have a less than optimal or limited uh, treatment. Or they can have failures of follow-ups. And of course, they can have brief uh, stenosis or occlusion. So I want to go through those a little bit. I don't have time to go through this as quick, uh, as much as I would like, but uh, it's the beginning of the lecture I will put together. It'll be about three hours long. I want to skip this here. We have, we have I know, I understand. I'm not going to. Okay, so what are failed diagnostic evaluations? They include an incomplete assessment of the veins that are associated with this problem or they could be due to failed detection of the abnormalities on a good venogram. So intraluminal pathology, we know, is not always visible on a venogram because we find some of it on only on an iris. So we know that that's not possible. They can have technical problems or in poor imaging studies that hide things. Uh, or they could just be observer <coughs> errors. They could overlook primary abnormalities or they could miss secondary abnormalities that could contribute to it and they can misinterpret things as well. So among the incomplete assessments are, you know, not evaluating the brachiocephalic veins that drain the jugular veins, uh, certainly see that, uh, hemiasicus abnormalities, because we see that, and left renal vein abnormalities, which are very common in patients with multiple sclerosis, and even less commonly, the May-Turner syndrome can drive blood into the 
into the spinal circulation and overload the cerebrospinal circulation. There could be hypoplasias of the dural sinuses or occlusions of the dural sinuses that could seriously impact on this outflow. Technical difficulties are usually associated with filming techniques, how fast you film or how slow you film, and the contrast agents may be too dense or not dense enough to evaluate the structures and give you a bad, uh, a failed diagnostic evaluation. This, to me, to most people looking at this, it looks like a perfectly normal vein. Yet there's a 99% stenosis here. And the only, the only thing that indicates that there's a stenosis here is that collateral vein that you see over here. Now why? Because the contrast is too dense. If I look at it again, and I inject it very slowly, so it doesn't reflux too much, you can see that the stenosis comes down to a pinpoint here. And all this contrast that's hiding, over, hiding the stenosis here is below the valve. So if you don't do this properly, you don't treat that lesion. And if you don't treat a jugular vein, I don't seriously think it's going to be difficult to, uh, to do this. There are other failed diagnostic evaluations, and among those include the overlooked primary abnormalities. For example, many people put the catheter in the middle of the jugular vein. They never even see the top of the jugular vein when they do the treatment. But if you put the catheter in the dural sinus, it's the only way you can be assured, well not the only way, but the most reliable way of being assured that you see the entire jugular vein. And while most of the lesions occur at the bottom of the jugular vein, some of them occur at the upper part. So if you only treat the, the lower part, it's really not going to be effective. Some people ignore muscular and bony compressions, but Dr. Arslan showed me a case today that was quite impressive of compression where uh, by the muscles of the neck and only after treating that with uh, a stent did the patient get relief. After how many patients, how many treatments did that patient have? Two? Two. Before, the, before you did that, right? No, no, Second. no treatment before I did it. You did two? That's another case, yeah. I did, you, I did two. You have put a stent in somebody who had a compression? Yes. How many treatments? The first treatment? Or first treatment. Oh, okay. Because balloon didn't respond to balloon. Okay, okay. Uh, valvular stenosis, we talked about, and these other things, uh, webs and septums, membranes, duplications. These are all abnormalities that are associated with chronic cerebrospinal venous insufficiency if you believe or consider it possible that this is a congenital malformation of the veins, which many people do. Here's an example of a patient who has a stenosis in the, the usual location, treated by balloon angioplasty. Uh, but the question is, is this really the jugular vein? And what's this vein here? But reality is that neither one of those is the jugular vein. The jugular vein goes this way. And when we look at the jugular vein in total, we can see that there's a lot of collaterals around this high-grade stenosis right here. So this patient was treated by balloon angioplasty. And now we have a completely continuous open venous structure. And that's what our goal was. Treating one uh, stenosis and not treating the other is like not going to work. Okay. So failed diagnostic evaluations also come from having not evaluated the secondary abnormalities, the dural sinus, brachiocephalic vein, and the nutcracker phenomenon. The nutcracker phenomenon is a compression of the renal vein by uh, the aorta uh, on below it and the intestinal artery above it. And those two form a compressive force on the renal vein. Now this is supposed to occur in about 15% of humans. Uh, patients with MS have approximately, 50% of them have uh, uh, a nutcracker syndrome. And among the nutcracker syndrome, 23% have a stenosis more than 70%. It's extraordinary. It's so different than a healthy control population where one out of 100 would have a 90% stenosis. We see this all the time. Now, what, what's the kidney got to do with the brain? Well, to a urologist or to a nephrologist, it means everything. Because if the kidneys don't work, the brain doesn't work. So to a neurologist, of course, the kidneys are only there to support the brain, but it goes both ways. The flow in the renal vein is more than the flow in one hemisphere. The, 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 the flow in the renal vein is more than the flow from one side of the brain. About 25% more flow goes through the renal vein than through the cerebral jugular vein system. If the renal vein is obstructed, there are only three major veins that can drain that blood, and two of them end up in the spine. So if you have all that blood flow going into the spine, you congest the vertebral plexus, 
And this is all about congestion of a, of a, a system of fluid that extends from the brain to the bottom of the spine. That's what we're talking about. So if you don't look for this, you don't find it. Most of us are very com comfortable with knowing that there's a compression. We all know about it. And the majority of the patients that we have uh, assessed are patients who have all the blood diverted and going into the ovarian vein or the, uh, the spermatic vein in the man. But the truth is, there are two other major veins that I mentioned. And some patients may have pelvic pain they may have uh, bladder problems, and they think the bladder problems are part of the MS, which is often a common situation. But in some of them, it's related to the pelvic congestion. So these are things that should not be overlooked. I have one patient who had no treatment except the renal vein obstruction, and her vision got better the next day. It's, I know a neurologist, not going to believe that. But this is what happens. You get an obstruction of the renal vein. You can see all the blood. Uh, the contrast is extending into the spine and, and, and the vertebral plexus. Uh, failed diagnostics include misinterpretations. I've seen patients uh, treated elsewhere who had uh, catheterization of the, the vertebral vein, and it was diagnosed as a uh, occluded internal jugular vein, and it had the same vein catheterized and been called a normal jugular. So there are a lot of problems with people who don't quite understand some of these issues. Uh, and here's one that was called a normal internal jugular vein. Now, I, anybody with experience not, not, is going to know that. But the truth of the matter is they never catheterized this patient's jugular vein. And that jugular vein was catheterizable and actually treated. So if you don't treat things, you're not going to get better. Now, in terms of therapy, if you're unable to cross the stenosis and you stop, you lose. You made a mistake. Somebody's got to fix that. You can't ignore it. And there are things to do when you can't traverse the stenosis that can actually open the vein up. You can underestimate and overestimate the size of the vein or the degree of stenosis. And you can over and under dilate the vein. And you can use inadequate pressure and it may look better, but it's not going to stay open if you don't really get those valves all the way open. So if you accept an incomplete dilatation, then your chances of getting restenosis are higher. And earlier restenosis is going to be higher. Um, okay, so here's a patient who could not be cannulated from the jugular vein, no matter what was tried. They couldn't get past here, and they stopped. But by in puncturing the jugular vein up high, it was relatively simple to get across, get down, and open up that vein. And that patient responded after that. Didn't respond more than a couple of weeks, probably from the improvement on the other side, uh, during the first treatment. Um, this is a case where Iva showed that after this angioplasty looks pretty good, there's still some of the valve is still stenosed. Uh, if you look really carefully and you change the contrast of the injection, you can see that there's stenosis present still in that valve. And then after retreatment, the valve is now open, and now we've optimized our possibilities. Balloon selection is much better with IVUS because you measure the entire vein to a much greater degree of accuracy to the tenth of a square millimeter in terms of dimension. And you can pick balloon sizes much more effectively, accurately, and predictable based on IVUS than you can by catheter venography. Uh, failure of follow-up is a very big problem. Part of, that's not, part of that is the radiologist's fault, no question about it, or the operator's fault. Part of it's the patient's fault. Patients don't do the follow-up they're supposed to do. And it's very difficult in an early study like we're doing now to not get that follow-up. Patients have an ethical duty, in my opinion, to follow up, and doctors have a medical, ethical, and legal responsibility to do that. And failure to identify restenosis early may make it more difficult in the future to salvage that vein. And we've seen people who had three, four-week treatment and it reverts, the symptoms go, uh, come back, and the doctor said, this did not work for you. You're doomed. Yet I've taken those patients on, opened up their veins, and they've had dramatic improvements. I think the doctor's responsible for tobacco cessation support. Patients smoking are at higher risk of thrombosis, and the patients need to understand that they're wasting their money if they're not going to take care of that problem. 
I think an not anticoagulating leads to a lot of thrombosis. And early, in my practice, an early failure or recurrence of symptoms immediately, immediately, within 48 hours, has to get an ultrasound. And if it's thrombosis, they need an immediate, within 48 hours, I don't care where they live, they've got to get back for us to get that vein open. Waiting four weeks may make it impossible to recanalize that vein. It's so critical to take care of that in, in an early period of time. So I use ultrasound within a month, and uh, we look for thrombosis within one month of our treatment plan. Uh, restenosis is common in Zamboni's uh, practice, and uh, I think we have to consider it, take it seriously, and when things go back to where they were or start to deteriorate, restenosis is what's going on. And I think I'll stop because I'm taking up too much time. But this, my conclusion is that not all non-response is placebo. Not all non-response is doomed to failure. It's often due to an inadequate intervention. And I don't consider restenosis a failure, but rather part of the natural history of treatment of veins. So early detection and Commitment to the patient may very well salvage a situation and turn a non-responder to an, into a, uh, a miracle. Thank you.